Good morning. Let's stand for our call to worship this morning. Be hymn number 297. Majesty, worship his majesty. Have our fellowship hymn, brother Tim. Let's have our fellowship hymn and uh, greet the ones around us. Kids, you're released to go to Children's Church, and then we'll come back and sing hymn number 480, step by step. Good to have you here today. We appreciate you coming and being a part of us. We have some special prayer needs this morning. Uh, we have added pinned in this morning. Uh, Mr. Robert Causey, good friend of our family, has cancer and will have uh, part of his lungs taken out tomorrow down in uh, Oshner's and Robert Causey. Also, the John Dunaway family. Uh, we also have Sissy Wally and Bill Davis family. Uh, also, Tim Gore and Forest General Tim's in real serious condition. And uh, septic, one I understand. Ask if you would to remember Tim Gore and uh, all of that family. Also, Joanne Thornhill, uh, reoccurrence of cancer. We have a lot of new people we've typed in as well on the new additions, and so we encourage you to get a list, but also pin those in, those special needs. Uh, do you have an unspoken request? 
love you do. Okay? All right. Well, let's just remember these. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we will continue on. Let us pray. Father, just, Lord, we pray, God, for our friends. Lord, those that have the special needs this morning, we pray for Tim and uh, Mr. Robert. And, Lord, we just think about so, so many others. We just pray, God, for these lost loved ones. Uh, God, as they go through this hard time in their life, God, I just pray that you would strengthen them, God, and give them the encouragement that they need. Lord, those that throughout this year that we, as we know, a day is, today is a hard day for a lot of people, uh, being it's Valentine's Day and uh, being able to have a place that's empty that was once filled. God, we just pray for those as they have to go through uh, missing someone they love dearly. Just pray that you'd help them, Lord, as God, they go through the, the long days and the difficult nights as they miss that person. Uh, Lord, we know that uh, we do have a hope, God, that is beyond this life, that we'll meet our loved ones again. Father, I just pray, God, that you would continue to bless the work that goes on here. Uh, Lord, help us not to get discouraged. God, I pray you would help us, Lord, to not grow weary in well-doing. We know, God, that we, uh, our, our labor is not in vain, Lord, that we labor for the Master. Uh, until Jesus comes, we'll work, just like the old song says. Thank you again for each person that has come. I pray, Lord, for our children over in Children's Church, that you would be with them as they have an awesome time of worship this morning. Uh, give us the strength that we need, Lord, but most of all, we pray we'd hear a word from you, uh, God, that we would just know, uh, God, that we've had an experience with you when we leave this place. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. There's just a couple of one or two announcements that I wanted to bring to your attention. As you noticed in your bulletin, uh, there is a sheet of paper that's been placed in your bulletin there. Uh, this piece of paper is uh, a special announcement to the church. And uh, back in 2008, there was a lot of, there was, uh, the Fellowship Hall Committee actually began their, their journey. And um, there's been different ones that's been on that committee, but they have come to the conclusion of the work that they have been doing. And uh, they have uh, asked to present their findings to you next Sunday on the February the 21st after the morning worship service and so the information is here part of it some of it you can see uh, you'll need to be here next Sunday that'll be just presentation only and uh, the actual drawing of the actual fellowship hall building is there on that sheet of paper and then there is a special call business meeting that will be held on March 6th uh, after the morning worship service to vote by secret ballot if the church wants to do this or not so you just pray God's will be done and that's what we need to pray about whatever the Lord's desire may be and uh, and so anyway, I wanted to make that announcement. Also, I'm looking forward to you coming to be a part of us tonight. There's going to be some pictures taken for all the families that come in or people that come in that would like to have their picture made. Uh, so you want to come for the, the meal tonight. And uh, Brock's going to tell you, I think, uh, I believe he will, uh, what time that is and so forth. And uh, he'll reiterate on that and stuff. We'll leave that up to him. But I'd love to see you here and for the time for our movie as well. Uh, Brock, if you will, uh, if you will come. And also, if you're, if you're a guest, thanks for being here today. Good morning uh, to you out there. Uh, if you haven't heard it today yet, happy Valentine's Day. Uh, uh, the, we, we do have Valentine's Day plans tonight, so guys, if you uh, forgot to get your sweetie something you can bring her to a dinner and a movie tonight we're going to eat at 4 45 tonight for those that signed up in the family life center and then the movie will begin in here at 5 30 um, tonight hope to see you for that uh, the fellowship hall committee will present the fellowship hall presentation and the approximate cost next sunday morning after the morning worship service uh, brother tim hit on that briefly a minute ago and then next Sunday evening after the worship service the deacons will have a special call meeting um, so please be aware of that uh, I think that's all I'm gonna hit on this morning uh, we had 176 present this morning with three visitors and 13 on the phone ministry. Next hymn will be hymn number 228, Alas and Did My Savior Bleed. You may stay seated.
Got to ask who had birthdays this week. Y'all make me see. I see somebody pointing. I'm looking his way. I'm gonna make you chase. <laughs> Caleb is the only one. Sing happy birthday. Who else? Oh, stand up. Okay, I can come up on stage if you like. Caleb, stand up for us. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. God bless you. Happy birthday to you. The big 18? 18. Wow. I knew everything at 18. <laughs> Let's stand for offertory hymn, be hymn number 493. We'll sing the first, third, and fourth verse. We praise thee, O God. For the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb.
Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May so be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for another beautiful day to be able to come and worship you, Lord. Be with us, Lord, as we bring our tithes to the warehouse, Lord, that we use them the way that you'd have us to, Lord. Be with each and every one of us, Lord, that we go out and let others see the true meaning of you in us, Lord, in all that we do. Be with each and every one of us, Lord, and help us stand up for you in all that we do, Lord. And Lord, thank you for being with those on our prayer list that are sick and hurting, Lord. You know each and every one of us needs. Reach out and comfort each and every one of them, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's the light that pierces through you to the darkest hidden place. It knows your deepest secrets, but it never looks away. It's the gentle hand that pulls you from the judgment of the crown. When you stand before the guilty and you But for 
It's good to see you here today. We appreciate your faithfulness to be here. I hope that you're having a great Valentine's Day, and uh, maybe uh, you've been done right by your loved one, and, and uh, hopefully we encourage you to, if you've signed up, make sure to be here tonight for our meal, and we have a great movie tonight. It's War Room, and if you've never, and it's not about a war, by the way, some of you was asking that, and it's not about a war, but it is warfare. It's talking about spiritual warfare, and we encourage you to come and, and, and watch that. That movie actually starts at 530 here in the sanctuary. Uh, the meal is 4 40-ish, something like that. So anyway, and pictures will be made so for folks coming in. <clears throat> a free 4 by 6 will be given to those that have their picture made. Uh, I love that song that she just finished singing there. It's an awesome song. But today is a day we talk about love. The greatest is love. And uh, really, what is love? What, what does love mean to you? Well, maybe this will give us a, an example if you'll watch this. Love. 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 Love in this world is pretty messed up. It asks for a lot and it never returns the favor. Love in my world? Well, it brings more trouble than it's worth. In my world, love has felt like sabotage. It flees into the night. It, it, it leaves at the first sign of trouble. And it never feels like I love you no matter what. Because love in my world, it leaves. And when it leaves, there's only disaster left. No oh, promise is a lot, but it doesn't deliver much. It breaks hearts. I've picked up the pieces of my broken heart one too many times. So I build walls. Love isn't worth the tears. The pain, the loneliness. The surrender. It's exhausting. Even when you try to do love right, love fails. I have made a mess out of love. What good is it? You can't help me. Why love at all? Why do I even try to love? Why sacrifice to carry the burden? Why? 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 Because there is a perfect love. Perfect love that can end the disaster. A perfect love that can heal the brokenhearted. There is a love that saved those who are dwelling in this messed up world. God tells us about it because we wouldn't recognize it if it showed up on our own doorstep. It's a love that takes its time. It's profound. It doesn't brag or badmouth. God's love is like a shield that we know will never leave us. That you can trust. Hoping. And you never, ever exhaust it. That's his kind of love. And it never fails. And while we were keeping records of wrongs and self-seeking and being unkind, he still died for us. How can I love like that? How can I love like that? How can I love like that? Because I am loved like that. I can love well, not because of me, but because he first loved me. The greatest of these is love. In Mark chapter 12 and verse 28 through 31, if you will, Turn with me in your Bibles there, and let's look at this passage of Scripture. The greatest is love. Mark 12, verse 28 through 31. It says, One of the scribes came and heard them arguing, and recognizing that he had answered them well, asked him, What commandment is the foremost of all, the greatest of all? And Jesus answered, The, the greatest is, or the foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind and with all of your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
There is no other commandment greater than these. In the Jewish books of the law, as we look at the Jewish books of the law, you have five books of our, in our English Bible. There's 613 laws that are given to men. And of these laws here, 248 are considered to be positive in nature. And then you have 365 that's considered to be negative. And so what I'm saying is, is that some of them compel the people to do some things. And there are some of those laws that God says things we shouldn't do. Of all of these 613 laws that form the basis for the Jewish belief and practice, it seems that these scribes and these religious elite and doctors, it says, and all of the lawyers there, in Luke eleven forty six, 46, it is misinterpreted. And, and, and to spend most of their time debating on which one of these was the most important, 613 laws. And so the lawyer's question here in this passage, it seems to have been at least legitimate. And having said that, is, it is the answer that Jesus Christ gave to this man is of the utmost importance. Jesus boils down the law and the commandments and all of the teachings of the prophets into one single word, and that word is love. This is something that our world is starved for today. This is something that the world has no idea about. And it has an idea of what love is, but it is not the love that God is speaking about. The, the kind of love that God is talking about is defined and explained by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, in verses 1 through 13. So many times you hear that verse shared in an actual wedding ceremony. I want to read that passage one more time, and I want you to listen to these verses here. In 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, and verse number 1 through 13, a long passage. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become as a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know, know all mystery and all knowledge, and I have all faith as to move, remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. In other words, you can know everything you want to about the Bible. You can quote it backwards and forwards. But if love is void inside of your heart, you don't know anything. And if I give all of my possessions to feed the poor and I surrender my body to be burned and do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. And it does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It's not provoked. and does not take into account a wrong suffered. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, and hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away with. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then I will know fully just as I also have been fully known. But now faith, hope, love, abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter. So as he concludes his thoughts on the idea of love, Paul says that all things remain in this world. Love, of all the things that we find in this world, love is the greatest. And sometimes it's hard for people to be loved because they've never been shown love. But you know what? When a person meets Jesus Christ, I think that we'll have love inside of our heart because God puts something different on the inside of our life when we meet Jesus Christ. The greatest is love. I want to share that with you today. And so as I do, I want you to please be aware that Jesus takes our life. He takes our entire purpose for existing in this world. And he sums it up in these few verses here. And I want to look for a while at that thought of the greatest is love. What is the greatest thing that you could do for another person? 
Let's look here at the characteristics of this great commandment in this verse here. The supreme commandment. In these verses here, Jesus tells a man that, that he has the responsibility to love God ahead of everything else in this world and to love the Lord with every faculty that he may have, everything that he has in him. Jesus begins quoting what is called the Shema. And, and this is a quotation back in Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter, and four, verses 4 and 5, back in the book of the law. This passage was quoted by every single Jew every single day of their life during the time of prayer. And in doing so, why they done that was because they were reminding themselves that there was no other God but Jehovah God and that anything else that occupied first place in their life, that in essence it was an idol. It was something that should not have been there. And so this is still true today. Like the Jews of old, we're going to have to be certain that God occupies the first place inside of our life ahead of every other love that you may have, ahead of every other allegiance that you may have. And Colossians 1.18, it's in that verse, it says, He is also head of the body, the church, and He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that He Himself will come to have first place in everything. And there it is. That God will have first place in everything. And so we say he, we, he is first, and we, but yet sometimes we place other things ahead of Him in our life. You know, our actions will speak louder than the words that come out of our mouth. And in these words of Jesus, we can see that He intends for us to place the Lord God ahead of everything else. I want you to notice some areas in which we're to love the Lord supremely. He gave us these areas here. We're supposed to love the Lord with all of our heart. And what does that mean, love the Lord with a, all of your heart? Well, sometimes the, the, the word heart's used re, to refer to the seed of our emotions. But that's not the actual intention in this actual verse here. And people, you know, say, well, how do we know that? We study the Greek and understand the original Greek meaning of these words. And so, therefore, when Jesus, what Jesus is saying here is that we're to love the Lord without pretense. We're to be genuine in our love for Him and not just say, well, I love the Lord, you know. And then our lives, does, they do not reflect what we say we do. There's a lot of people that walk around saying that they're Christians. And, but yet their life will never reflect it because you will know them by the fruit that they bear. You will know them how that they dog down people with their mouth and talk down to people. But yet there's seemingly no love inside of their heart. We are to be genuine in our love and we're not to be hypocrites. We are also to love the Lord with all of our soul. What does that mean, to love Him with all of our soul? This involves the idea of our emotions. We're not to love God with some kind of an antiseptic love, you know, but we're to be um, uh, emotional in our love for Him. And this is our, our love for God should touch us at our most intimate level. We're to love the Lord with all of our emotional self. That's what he's saying. But also we're supposed to love the Lord with all of our mind. You know, so this is where to involve our intellect as we love the Lord. You know, this, is, this love is not just empty-headedness, you know, but we're to love the Lord because we, we have considered Him, we, we've meditated on Him, and we make a conscious decision that we're going to follow Jesus Christ and we're going to love the Lord. In other words, you shouldn't love God just because the preacher says so or just because it's Grandma's religion. You're supposed to love God because that's coming from the deepest area of your heart and you're going to love God with everything that you have on the inside of you, not because somebody else said so, not because of something that you go through with and ritualistic. It is something because you have something that has happened on the inside of your life and you love Jesus because of what he means to you. Amen. You shouldn't love God just because of what he can do for you. You should love him because of who he is and what he's done for you. Love him with all of your mind. But then he says, love him with all of your strength. And this implies that our love for the Lord is not to be a thing that, a thing that is done in word alone. But it should also, we should see an expression in our physical bodies. Notice it says, with all of our strength. If we love the Lord, then this body that, that is here is his as well. Your body belongs to the Lord. We have no right to divorce the physical from the spiritual. True love for Jesus is always carried out by the physical man as well as the spiritual person. If all of these things are taken together, it becomes clear that the Lord is telling us to love God with, with perfect serenity, with a fervency, with the fullest exercise of an enlightened reason. I'm simply saying that we're supposed to give Him everything that we've got. 
And this is the spirit of the great commandment, the verse that we've just read. True love for Jesus Christ, it will show itself in every single area of your life. Do you love his people? Do you love his word? Do you love the place that we come to meet at? Do you love uh, uh, the world that he made? Not necessarily be of the world, but you love what God created in this world. Do you love his commandments? Do you love his worship? It's going to affect every area of our life. And so following a, a great victory, King Cyrus of Persia, he took his prisoner, a, a noble prince, his wife and the kids that they had, and so when they were brought in before into the leader's tent there to stand before him, Cyrus said to the prince, he looked at him and he said, what will give, you give me if I set you free? And he said, I will give you half of all of I possess. Well, what will you give me if I release your children? Said Cyrus. Well, your majesty, I will give you all that I possess. And the king said, well, what will you give me if I set your wife at liberty? And looking at the one that he loved so dearly, the prince replied without hesitation, If you'll restore my wife to freedom, I will give you my life. And he was so moved because of this devotion that he released the entire family without asking for anything. And that evening, the, the prince said to his wife, Do you think not Cyrus is a very handsome man? She said, I didn't even notice him. She, my dear wife, she said, My dear, where in the world was your eyes then? And she said, I had my eyes only for the one who said that he would lay down his life for me. Max Lucado tells the story of a fascinating story about the Taj Mahal. Now, we've all heard of the word Taj Mahal. Well, the favorite wife of the Mughal emperor, Shah Jahan, died. And devastated, he resolved to, to honor his wonderful woman by constructing this wonderful temple and to preserve her memory and, as a big old tomb there. And so her coffin was placed out there in the, in the center of a large parcel of land there. And so in construction of this temple began in earnest, and there would be no expense spared. They were going to go all out trying to make her a resting place. But as the weeks began to roll and turn into months, the Shah's grief was eclipsed by his passion for the, prog the project that was taking place. He no longer mourned because of her absence. The construction consumed him. And one day while he was walking along there from one side of the construction site to the other side, he, his leg bumped against a wooden box and the prince brushed the, the dust off of his leg. And he, and he ordered one of the workers to get that box and carry it out. And Shah Jahan didn't understand. He had forgotten all about what was inside of that box. He had forgotten beneath the layers of the dust the one the temple was actually intended to honor was forgotten, but the temple was erected anyway. Could someone build a temple and forget why? Could someone actually construct a palace and forget all about the king? You know, the next time that you enter an assembly of worship and you, you position yourself where you can see people and you decide, you can tell the ones who remembers the slain one. They're wide-eyed and they're expectant and you see children that is watching as if they're unwrapping a gift at Christmas time. Or a servant that is standing still as the king passes by. You don't doze in the presence of royalty and you don't, don't yawn while receiving a gift. But you can also tell the ones who only see the temple. Their eyes wander and their feet shuffle and their hands wringle and their hands doodle and their and their mouth opens not to sing and yet they yawn for no matter how hard they try to stay amazed their eyes become glazed all temples even the Taj Mahal they lose their luster after a while the temple gazers don't mean to be bored they love the church they don't mean to grow stale they put on their hats and their coats and their ties and they come every week but yet there's something missing the one that they once plan to honor they haven't seen in a while but those who have seen him they just can't seem to forget him they find him in spite of the temple they brush the dust away and they stand ever impressed before his tomb before his empty tomb Jesus notice in verse 30 in King James it says the word thy it's impossible for a person to properly love the Lord until they personally know the Lord. 1 John 4, 19 makes this abundantly clear to us. 
We don't have the capacity to love Him until He first calls us into a relationship with Him. And after salvation, then it's possible to love the Lord. But we also have here a secondary commandment in verse 31. Now, that's a little bit misleading to call it a secondary commandment. Both of them are very closely intertwined here. But it's impossible just about to do one without the other. And given us what he called the second great commandment, Jesus quoted from Leviticus 19, 18. And Jesus was simply telling us that we are to love others with the same love with which we ourselves have been bestowed. Love has been bestowed upon us. We are to place others in such a position that we're constantly looking out for that person's best interest, their welfare, for their good. Just as Philippians 2, 3 says and Romans 12, 10 makes it abundantly clear. The idea here is that we are to love others with the same type of compassion and obligation that we feel toward ourselves. If we're honest, we probably think pretty highly of ourselves, don't we? But we are to show the same regard for those around us. But how does that kind of love, if we have the love of Jesus Christ on the inside of us, how does that kind of love manifest itself? I think it manifests itself through forgiveness. There's a problem with someone that just can't forgive someone. Regardless of what they've done, we have to forgive because that's what Jesus would do. But a person who has the love of Jesus Christ on the inside of them, they're going to show compassion. And I believe that they will also strive for unity inside of their own heart, in their own families, and in the life of a church. In English, we speak of what is known as person. And I'm referring to, to myself. If I say myself, then I will say uh, I will say I am. That is known as the first person. And then we, if you were speaking to you, we say that is, uh, I might say, you are. And then that is the second person. And then if I was speaking of another, I, I might say he is. And this is known as the third person. Now understand something of what we're doing here. In English, we've always had self first in English. But if you go back in the Hebrew, it's just the opposite. First person says he is. Second person says you are, and third person says I am. Therein is contained the formula for joy in this life. If we'll learn to place God where he belongs, he is first. First person. Others are second, and, and then we'll be willing to take that third place in our life. Do you know, want to know what the true formula for joy is? It's an acrostic. It's Jesus. Then you have others, and then you have yourself. Genuine love is sacrificial. In the 16th century England, there was a man by the name of Oliver Cromwell. Many of you can remember back in your history lessons. He ordered that a soldier be shot by the cause of the crimes that he had committed. And he was going to die that afternoon at the ringing of the bell. But that night, as that fateful hour began to roll around, there was no bell actually that could be heard from the bell tower. And the girl that was going to be married to this guy, he she climbed up into this bell tower and, and she had clung to this great big old clapper to keep this bell from ringing. And the king had heard about it, so Cromwell had her brought before him. And I want you to give an account of yourself of what you've actually done. And she took her hands and she showed her hands. They were bleeding and they were bruised. And Cromwell was greatly impressed and he says, your lover is alive because of your sacrifice. He will not be shot. I want you to notice the specifics of these commandments. When Jesus used the word love, he could have used four Greek words to do so. Storge, eros, phileo, and agape. When you talk about storge, excuse me, when you talk about storge, it refers to the love of things. When you talk about eros, it refers to the erotic or sexual love. And phileo is an, a tender and affectionate love towards somebody. And then agape is, of course, is an unchanging, never-ending, all-consuming love for someone. And this is, this is not the kind of feeling that appears for just a time and then it changes and it disappears. Agape love is forever. It is the kind of love of which God loves sinners. And it's genuine and it's heartfelt. I've had people to say, how can God love me because of the things that I've committed in my life? Because that's what God does is dish out some agape on you. God loves you. It's a genuine, heartfelt, all-encompassing love. And it's not going to be changed by circumstances. It is a love that loves without regard for the worth of the object that is being loved. 
This is more, it's just more than simple affection or emotional feeling. This is the kind of love that can be seen. I want you to notice God's love. Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. A five-year-old little old boy came, became very angry with his mother and his father. And he said, I'm going to run away from home. And so he began to pack his suitcase and he packed it up and he walked out of the house with his small suitcase and he began to trudge around the block again and again walking. And finally the day was coming to a close and the policeman noticed this kid. And finally the cop walked over and asked him, he said, hey, what's the idea? The little boy said, I'm running away. Officer said, running away? I've been watching you all afternoon. Says, you've been walking around and around this block. You're not running away. You call that running away? And the little boy began to burst into tears and he said, well, he said, what do you expect me to do? He said, I'm not allowed to cross the street. He obviously respected his parents and he knew that they loved him. He couldn't really run away. I want you to see in verse 31 the completeness of the great commandments. Matthew twenty-two forty, 40, Jesus said that all of the other commandments hang on these. That is, if I love the Lord as I should, I will not sin against him. If I love my neighbor as I should, I will not offend him. When our love is right, then we're going to treat other people in the right kind of way. You find a person that is hard-hearted and bitter and cynical and always full of poison when they open their mouth, there's a problem inside of that person's heart with love. You find a person that curses all the time, Either they don't know Jesus or either their heart's out of sync with God. Because the love of God cannot live in a person like that. It just can't be. You're not going to drink out of a dirty vessel. Then how can we expect God to fill us to overflowing? Because what's in the heart will come out. Where there's a problem with the love for the Lord, there's going to be things that are things done that slight him. When we're out of line with God, it's going to be easier to harm other people. Also allow me to say that when there's a problem between us and a fellow man, it's an indication that there are problems in our love life. What Jesus is telling us is that we can always be assured that we'll do the right thing by God by allowing our fellow, that we'll love our Lord supremely, that we're going to love our fellow man like we should. I think it's just going to be a flow out of our life. Sometimes we're so worried about rules and regulations and the rights and the wrongs. But if we love God and we love others, I think that our life is going to be pleasing to the Lord. The last point I want to make in this message is the cost of the great commandments. If you're going to fulfill these great commandments, you're going to have to be aware that it's going to cost something. It's not cheap. If I'm going to love God with all of my heart, with all of my soul, and with all of my mind, and with all of my strength, then it's going to mean that I'm going to have to place His will ahead of my will. You're going to have to put God's wishes ahead of what you want. If you're going to be able to love God like you should, you're going to probably have to say no to some things that you may want to do in this life. I know I've had to do that means that I'm going to have to seek the Lord's will and, and make it paramount in my life. And quit saying, God, this is what I'm going to do and what I want to do. You're going to have to say, Lord, if I'm going to love you like I should, I've got to do what you believe me to do. You know, it might mean that you can't go to some places that other people go. I can, I can watch what other people watch, but you know what? I may not enjoy it. You know, I can talk like other people, but I may not enjoy it. And you can either live to please yourself or you can going to live to please your flesh. You can devote your life to pleasing the Lord. The choice is yours. Just don't think that serving God is no fun. But God does have rules and He expects us to be able to, to obey what He says. But I'm just simply saying that it's going to cost you if you're going to follow Jesus. If I'm going to love my neighbor as I love myself, that's going to cost me. I may have to eat some crow. You know, I may have to seek forgiveness when, I was, when I've done no wrong. You know, I may have to sacrifice something that I, that, that I think that meets my brother's needs. 
I may have to give up some time to help somebody else. I may have to spend some time in prayer reaching out to them in the name of the Lord. It may mean that I just can't sit back and watch the world go by. We'll have to become more involved. However, when I love as I should, I'm just simply proving that I belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. Is your love for God all that it should be? Do you pray to Him as you should? Do you study His Word as you should? Are there people or things that have crept in and taken over first place in your life? Is Jesus somewhere down the line after some person in your life, something in your life? What about your love for other people? Is it all it could be? I'm just simply trying to get you to see that if you really, really want to please the Lord, if you really want to please the Lord, there's only two things that are necessary. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, with all of thy soul, and with all of thy mind, and with all of thy strength. And number two, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You can do all of the outward things that a Christian does. And you can have it 100% down to an art. But everything else hinges on this. If you don't have it right inside your love for the Lord and your relationship with Him, then all that other stuff really don't matter. And God knows your heart. And God knows what condition it's in right now. Can you say, Preacher, I love the Lord with all of my soul, mind, heart. Or maybe you can't say that. Maybe there's a reason why you can't say that. Maybe there, there's, some, there's some unforgiveness inside of your heart. You're not going to be able to love the Lord if you're out with outs with your fellow man. You're not going to be able to do it. How can you worship God is Eddie Ruddick, who's just died not long back, one of my professors in Hebrew. He says, how can you love God? Well, watch my arm. How can you love God and have that relationship right when you don't have this relationship right? Do you see what I just made? It's a cross. You've got to have your relationship with your fellow man right before you can serve the Lord. The Bible says if you have all against your brother, your, your friend, your, your neighbor, you can't come and bring your gift unto the Lord. Go and make it right with your fellow man and then come and bring and worship the Lord. You're, it's going to affect everything you do. You're just not going to be able to do much anything if you love life with Jesus. It's not right. Let us pray. Father, we... Lord, sometimes we just veer off course. God, we, some of us may not be where we need to be in our love life with Christ. Father, I pray that every one of us, Lord, who claim the Lord Jesus, their Lord and Savior, be able to say that we love the Lord with everything that we have within us. Lord, regardless of the things that we've done in our life, the sins that we've committed, the, the, the crash and burns that, that we have experienced, we know you're never going to stop loving us, and we thank you for that. God, I thank you that you don't give us what we deserve. You love us in spite of all of those things in our life. Father, I pray you would help us, Lord, to draw closer to you, God, that we would have the strong relationship that we need. Father, it's all about a relationship with you, and it's not about religion and rituals. It's about a relationship with Christ. And Father, we know, Lord, that these men that he was speaking to that day in the Gospels. They were all about going through the motions, but they never fully understood that it was about a deep relationship with Jesus Christ. Father, I pray, Lord, for the person this morning that needs to get their heart right with God. They've been walking through the motions. and They don't love him with everything they have. They're not willing to go and follow his will. They're not willing to give it up. They're not willing to take the pain. They're not willing to sacrifice. 
Father, help us to sell out to Jesus. Lord, help us to leave nothing behind. Help us to leave it all on the playing field out there when we walk off this field we call life. Father, if there's someone here today that does not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, Father, I'm praying that today that they would come to meet the one who can truly love them. I pray today would be that day that they would find peace in their heart. Father, there's in the crowd this large, someone is in the midst of an unpeaceful life. And Lord, we know we're going to have problems. We're going to have issues. That's life. But Lord, I pray we would sense your presence. Lord, you would remind us that you're still there. That you would remind us that you still love us. God, there are times where we feel like we've done what we're supposed to do. And God, that we're trying to serve you as faithfully as we could. And God, it just seems like it still falls apart. God, regardless of what may happen with circumstances, we know you still love us. And that you're going to walk us all the way across when it comes our time to leave this world. Help us, Lord, as we have this invitation. Lord, I pray that they would make a move toward the cross and get their relationship right with God. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please, please stand? If God has dealt with your heart and you need to make your life right with Jesus, you know you're saved, we encourage you to come and walk this aisle. Get down to this altar. You can come to me. I'll pray with you. Or you can come and I can introduce you to my best friend, Jesus. The Savior is waiting to enter your heart why don't you let him come in there's nothing in this world to keep you apart what is your answer I'm going to ask our musicians that they would to play. I'm going to ask everybody in this place if you'll just bow your heads for just a moment. The Spirit of God's dealing with people's hearts. And we're talking about eternity here. We're talking about forever. We're talking about when you leave out of this life, are you going to leave back behind you embarrassment, regrets, things that you should have done for Jesus? This is your chance to make your heart right with God. You get to a point where you just get tired of playing church and you want to follow Christ. It's going to cost you if you do. Just a moment, we're going to have one more verse. And this verse is for the person who's held back. They've resisted. God's dealt with your heart. You know what you should do, but you're resisting. There's no telling what God could do in your life. He wants to use you. If only you will allow him. Now we're going to have one more verse. Todd's going to lead us. And then we're going to close if nobody comes. Remember, you'll stand before God just like all the rest of the people one day. Because it's level at the foot of the cross. If you'll take one step toward the Savior, my friend, you'll find his arms open wide. Receive him and all of your darkness will end. Within your heart you abide. Time after time he has waited before, and now he is waiting again to see. 
Savior is waiting to enter your heart. Why don't you let him come in? There's nothing in this world to keep you apart. What is your to him time after time he has waited before and now he is waiting again to see just want to remind everybody that, uh, of course, if you always need to talk to me, I'll, I'll be around after church, and I'll be, let me know anytime. I'll do the very best I can to help you. Uh, I'll do the best I can to pray with you and show you through Scripture. Um, don't forget that we will not be having the Road to Calvary practice this afternoon. Uh, the meal starts at 440, if I'm correct on that, and then at 530, we will begin with War Room here in the sanctuary, uh, the actual movie. And, um, so I'm, I'm really excited about that. I have a desire in my heart to eventually get the chance to show Woodlawn here. I, I'd love to see that. That's a powerful movie as well. And uh, so we, uh, do y'all have anything? All right. Anybody have any announcements, any reminders, anything at all before we go? If you're a guest today, we, we uh, ask if you would to come back and see us. And if you don't have a church home, we would encourage you to pray about becoming a part of us here at New Hope. Uh, just pray for our associate pastor search committee as they're discerning the Lord's will. And, and so we need you is to pray for all of those that's on that committee. And, uh, and also, uh, Brother Eric, as he is out, so I ask if you would pray for him and his family as well. Uh, let's bow forward prayer, and then we will uh, go to the house. Make sure you tell one another that you love one another. Don't be like the man that looked at me standing beside his daughter's casket, and his wife was right there with him. He looked over in that casket in Denham Springs, Louisiana, and he told his daughter as she lay there. She was a young lady that was a nurse, and he looked at her, and he told her with tears streaming down his face, very hard-hearted man, he told her, he said, I love you, honey. And then after he come sat down, I sat down, and he told me that that was the first time that he had ever told his daughter. Was laying down. Make sure you tell your loved ones that you love them. Because you don't know when the last time that you'll have that chance may be. I'm not trying to scare you, trying to tell you a preacher's story. I'm just saying it's life, and we need to let each other know we love each other. Does that mean that they're going to be perfect? No, it, it's not. Because Christians, as I've said, Christians get cancer, Christians have divorce. But the fact of the matter is, we only have this one opportunity, and then you missed it. Make sure you tell your loved ones that you are. Let's bow forward prayer, and I'm going to ask Brother Howard Bennett to close us in this closing prayer. Mr. Howard. <laughs> 